But I just wanted to let you know there is an informative bill coming up September 19th, 6 p.m. at the Methodist Church if you want to go. So I just wanted to get that out there because I told them I would and there's nothing wrong with having good information on stuff, regardless of what it may be. I'm a researcher, so I love getting information. So if you're not, I understand that too. But anyway, so that's all we got. We have a wonderful worship service this morning. We're going to be looking at God's time anyway. So, what are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your time? That's what we'll be looking at. Before we get started on our next song, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I come to you today and I just praise you for this opportunity. Lord, for the freedoms we do have. Father, for the men and women who served and fought and died and sacrificed so much so we can continue to have these freedoms that are God-given from you, Lord, that you have given to all mankind. I praise you for that, Lord, and I thank you so much for the people who have sacrificed for us to maintain these freedoms. And I pray, Lord, that we never forget. We never forget the things that have happened, that we always look at that. But, Lord, most importantly, I pray that nobody ever forgets the freedom we have in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made so we can have that freedom in you, that everlasting life. Lord, I pray that we always, always use our time wisely to glorify you and rest in that freedom but continue to live in memories of others who have sacrificed so we can have the freedoms we have to proclaim Christ to all people. Lord, I praise you for that, and I thank you, Lord, for all your blessings you've given us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I have a back next Sunday. Hopefully they feel better. Let's turn to page 137. 137.
how I miss my mom and dad, my brother so badly, and how fast, and I was uh, singing this song, I thought, wow, in the morning when I meet them, that's how quick it's going to be, and what a glorious reunion it's going to be, amen.
so they don't mix me up with somebody else. Now, the bracelet also shows that you should be in the hospital, that you belong in the hospital, whether it's for tests or whether it's for surgery or whatever. Now, it's very likely that all of y'all have worn a bracelet like this at one time or another. Can you think about when you might have had this other than having surgery or test run? Weston? When you were born. Do they still do that? Yes, they do. I didn't know if they still did that or not. Um, yes, when you're born, a lot of y'all's mothers, if they're like me, have their children's ID bracelets in their baby book. That, that's how old my ID bracelets are. Now, <clears throat> boys and girls, when we give our lives to Jesus, when we give our hearts to Jesus, does he give us an ID bracelet to wear so he'll know who we are? No. He doesn't have to have an ID bracelet, boys and girls, because he knows every one of us by name. Not only does he know us by our name, but the Bible tells us, ladies, ladies, the Bible tells us that, um, I just lost my place. Okay, the Bible tells us that, um, He knows us. There we go. That's it. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I hope he knows Mark. He knows us. Oh, this is what I was going to say. He knows us all by names. The Bible tells us that uh, he knew us before we were born. It also tells us that he knows how many hairs are on our head. Now, the Bible also tells us that it should be very easy to see who belongs to Jesus because Christians are supposed to love each other like like Jesus loves us. Now, does that mean that we need to love the kids that smell bad? Does it mean that we need to love the kids that um, are a little bit weird? Probably. Probably it does. Can you think of ways that we can show each other as kids that we love each other? What are some ways, Krista? Making my birthday card on their birthday. Good, Cashlyn. Help 
on do the chores and stuff? Yes. Right. Good. Good job. What about um, helping somebody with their homework? If you're pretty sharp in math and you know somebody's not having and is having a hard time, maybe you can help them with their math. Yeah. What next? You can help them find it. There are a lot of ways that we can show people that we love them. Now, we need to love others so much that they'll know right away that we are people that love Jesus and that Jesus' love lives through us. Now, is that an easy assignment? Is it easy to love the kids who are a little weird? Or is it easy? I can say that because everybody thought my son was weird. But J.D. is a scientist. So he's on a different wavelength than everybody else. But So I can say that. And he even says that he himself is weird. But is it easy to love those people who are different than we are? Is it easy to love the kids who don't dress like we think they should be dressed? Is it easy to love people that pick at you all the time? It's hard to love those people. But you know what, boys and girls? Jesus calls us to love them. And it may be hard for us to do that, but he promises that he will help us to love the unlovable. So you think about that, okay? When you meet these people along, you remember that God wants us to love them too, just like he loves us. Let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you for this day, Lord. I just thank you for these children and these parents this morning to get their kids ready to come to church. Father, I thank you that these parents see that it's important for their kids to learn about you, Lord. Father, I pray that you would help us to act in such a way that people will know that we are Christians and that we belong to you. And Father, help us to love those who are unlovable because I'm sure that there are people who think we are unlovable. Father, we just thank you for loving us. In your name we pray, amen. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this week?
to those that don't, Jimmy Hoffa was a guy that was not exactly in the mafia, but he had mafia ties and he did things. And, you know, he bought elections and got people in that shouldn't have won and stuff like that. And a lot of things. But well, one month before he went missing, and oh yeah, he's been missing for 50-something years now. They have not found his body. One month before he went missing, he said, I don't need bodyguards. He was wrong. <laughs> Third, fix your attention on getting rich. There is nothing that you're going to waste your life more on than trying to get rich. For the love of money is the root of all evil. When you focus on getting rich, you waste time, precious time. Money is not everything. Four, compare yourself with others. When you start comparing yourself, say you're into fitness. Guys, you start comparing yourself with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I mean, come on, the guy is Rip or Hulk Hogan or anybody you want to think of that's big. Or if you, you know, women, you want to compare yourself with Megan Martin, somebody like that who's an American Ninja Warrior. Or even compare yourself with Trevor Brazil, Billy F. Bauer, or Haley Kinzel. We're not them. It doesn't matter how good you are. You may be as good a roper as Trevor Brazil. You may be as good a bronc rider as Billy F. Bauer. And you may be as good a barrel racer as Haley Kinzel, but you're not them, and they're not you. So if you want to waste time, start comparing yourself with someone you're not. That'll waste it. And fifth, lengthen your list of enemies. Start jotting down every day the people you want to take out. Oh, that's sorry. I'm going to break his knee. When you do that, you're just wasting time. All of those, all five of them, those will cause you to waste more time than anything else you can do. We're not built to do that kind of stuff. We're not made to compare. You, me, all of us in here, every one of us are made in the image of God. No reason to compare. God has placed you exactly where he has placed you for a specific purpose and reason. You're you. Be you. Do what God has gifted you to do. And don't let nobody else worry you about that. Don't have enemies. It's pointless. You know what happens when you have enemies that you hate? You have that list made out and you just don't uh, stand on them. You're not bothering that one bit. They're going on living life. You're in jail wasting your time and trying to get rich. Come on pointless. Just be like a good buddy of mine told me. He said, just accept it now. You're going to be in debt till the day you die. And you can be happy. That's what we need to do. Because time past is gone. Tomorrow is not promised. You're not promised another breath. But today is what we have. Right now. This instant. This is what we have. So use it and invest it in something that will outlast you. That's what we're going to see here in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 that Paul tells us. We're going to look a whole lot at this whole text, but I'm only going to read these three verses. But we're going to look at every, just about every verse in this little, from 1 to 21. Because it ties in to it's God's time anyway. He has given us this time. We need to use it wisely. So the text reads, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Boy, is that not true. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The will of the Lord, we're looking at that. Knowing God's will, God's will in this is to redeem the time, is what a lot of translations say there. Redeem the time. Use, make the best use of your time. Redemption means you're restoring, you're using the time rightly. So use the time God has given you rightly. It's not any different than when you are at work. You have a specific thing to do. And if you're sitting over there playing on your phone instead of doing your job, what usually happens if a boss of some form sees it? You kind of get in trouble. You're not using your time rightly. And that's what Paul is telling us here. So when we use God's time wisely, we're walking in wisdom, as he tells us right there. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. See, pointing back to that, we're walking in wisdom, we're imitating God as his children. Verse 1 tells us, be imitators of God as beloved children. Children seek to imitate their dad or their mother 
depending on the child. But almost all children want to be like their dad. Almost all boys want to be like their dad, at least to a certain point. And then they get to a point and they're like, okay, dad's embarrassing me. But then they grow out of that and they look back at that and see, man, I wasted time being ignorant and my dad was embarrassing. Look at all the things I could have learned. I know I look back at that at some points and realize where I screwed up, should have paid more attention. But we want to be like our dad. That's imitating. We need to imitate God. We need to see what he desires. Last week we spoke of that holy, holy, holy. He's superlative holy. And his desire is for all to be saved. When we're wasting time, are we walking in wisdom, trying to seek others to be saved, or are we seeking what we want? That's the question. And going from that, we see we walk in love. When we're imitating God, we're walking in love. God is love, as First John tells us. God is love. That is one of his attributes. He is love. It's not God has developed and made love. God is love. He's pure and perfect and holy love. So when we're walking in wisdom, we're walking in love. We're seeking to help others. We're seeking to grow others because we love them. See, and when we do that, we're imitating Christ who gave himself sacrificially. As verse 2 says, when we're doing this, we will give ourselves in a sacrificial way to others. We will sacrifice our own joy, our own pleasure, our own desires to help another. Somebody comes to you needing help, we will go out of love. Yes, let me help you. What can I do to help you? That's what we do in seeking after Christ. What did he do when he was here? Who did he go to? He didn't go to the healthy. He said, the healthy have no need of a physician. Only the sick. For I came to seek and to save that which is lost. We need to help others. That's what he did. That's what we do when we're in wisdom and we avoid all these other things. Verse 3, we avoid the sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness. We're not wasting our time seeking things that are unholy and unrighteous. We're seeking to avoid all of that. Just as in the next verse it talks about avoiding the filthy and foolish talk and nasty jokes. We're not wasting our time filling our heads with garbage. Because time spent is time lost. If all you're doing is continually filling your head with garbage, what's going to happen? You'll be walking under a trailer and whack your head. You're going to go, <clears throat> beep, 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 instead of something else. Sometimes, even when you have your head filled with rat stuff and you do it, you may slip and that happen anyway. I think God understands. But we don't need to be filling ourselves with that. We don't need to be hanging around that. How many times have you caught yourself possibly at work? And somebody tells a dirty joke or some form of an extraordinarily racist joke and you catch yourself laughing. Guilty. I'll be the first to raise my hand on that. I've done it. It happens. But we need to try to avoid that. When we're imitating God and we're walking in love and we're using wisdom, we will avoid that as much as possible because we're not trying to yoke ourselves with unbelievers. We're not trying to act as they do because all of those who are that way are not, they do not have inheritance in the kingdom. Unbelievers have zero inheritance in the kingdom. And this is how they behave. This is how they walk. This is how they use their time. They are vile and rude and impure. Even if they're a nice person to God, they're vile, impure, rude, and unholy. And here we are hanging with them and acting in this way. We're coveting that old lifestyle. We're not walking in wisdom. When you hang out, and that, but I'm not telling you to remove yourself from people. Paul that makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians that we're not to judge the outside world. Who are we to judge them? When we do that, we are to be, because if we were to do that, we'd have to remove ourselves from this world. And we can't do that. But we do not hang with them. We do not put ourselves in this unequally yoked what? As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 14. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? When he says to not be unequally yoked to unbelievers, we do not join to them and join up with them and be with them because they're not part of the flock of God. 
They're not in that sheepfold. They're outside of it. Some of them are wolves trying to get in. We don't join with them. We don't defile ourselves by joining up with them and walking in the ways they walk, as I preached in first in Psalm 1. We don't walk in the ways they We don't sit in the seat of scoffers. We don't stand with them. We share. We take Christ to them. We let our light shine into their darkness, but we don't try to join up with them. As Roger Dearingwater, the pastor I had as a child growing up, said, he said, when you pour clean water and dirty water, what happens? The clean water becomes dirty water. There has to be a filtration system that the dirty water goes through before it's clean. And that filtration system is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in their life. We take and share, but we don't join with them. That's where we fail in a lot of areas. We waste our time by thinking, if I just do this, I can reach them. It don't work. We become tainted as they are tainted. It's like I know people who have tried it and have the right heart, but they'll go and sit in the bar and drink a beer or two with these alcoholics that are known, and they're trying to reach them, and they think if I have a beer or two with them, they'll listen to me. They see you drinking that, and they think it's okay to continue in that path. And anybody who's ever struggled with alcoholism knows any excuse you can use to continue drinking, you're going to get it. So that's that tainted water. It doesn't work. We have to be that light, as Christ says in Matthew 5, 16. We are to be light now, and as that light shining, here's what he says, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That is using our time wisely and using wisdom. We shine that light because that light will cause people to see something. I go in the mornings very early, and I get up, and I do other work, and I walk. I walk a lot. And it's dark. And there's snakes, skunks, and other things, and other little boogers in the night. So I wear a headlamp. It gives me light. I can see what's in front of me. Without that, it's dark, and I can kind of see. But I stumble around. There's no telling what I'm about to step on. But with that light, I see what is there. And that's the light we should be shining for people. That light is not mixing with darkness. When you flip a light on in a pitch black room, what happens? Darkness is gone. It's the same with that. When we shine that light, we are using wisdom. And wisdom is better than gold. Even fine gold and the yield is better than choice silver. As we're told in Proverbs 8, 19. See, this wisdom is God. God gives wisdom because God is wisdom. It's part of Him. He is wise. And when we use it, we're using a part of God that he has given us. So we need to always walk in wisdom. Not unwise. When we're unwise, we're walking in the ways of the world. Instead of using our time rightly and moving and shining our light. And letting the world see that light. When we do that, when we're stepping out, we have God's power with us. Much like Elisha and his servant back in 2 Kings. The servant didn't know they were surrounded. He was scared. He had no clue what they were going to do. They were outnumbered. All of this foreign heathen army was there to destroy them. And Elisha prayed to God, God, please open his eyes so he can see. And the servant looked around and saw in the mountains all these chariots of fire and his amazing army, supernatural army of God, shining and showing. And his fear went away. Because he who is with us is greater than those who are in the world. That's the power you have. And when you know that, you have God's wisdom in you. And you will make a holy use of your time. As we practice holy use of our time, we will see that life is short and the days are evil. We all know the shortness, the brevity of life. All of us have experienced that in some form. Life is not very long. You might get 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. 100 years is nothing for the span of eternity. Eternity, we can't even fathom. You can't fathom the size. Eternity is amazing. It's like taking a, a penny and dropping it in the middle of America. Eternity is so much more. You'll never find that penny. Our life is that penny. 
It is forever. See, this life we get, as Moses said in Psalm 90, verse 10, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. That is this life. So why do we want to waste so much time focusing on the things of this earth? We all do it. We get caught up in that instead of seeking to have something that is going to outlast us. God's will is for us to make good use of our time, to awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Is what Paul says in verse 14. We need to arise from sleep. We need to stand up and go out and be awake, keep our head high, our chest out, because we have Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit living in us. That is the power we have in this world. When we just walk around doing nothing, we are bringing shame upon God. We're not giving Him glory. This time, the time, the hour is short. We see it. If you've studied scripture much at all, you're reading in there and you are seeing the happenings of this world going on right now. It is getting evil. The world is evil. And it's getting more and more and more and more evil. The time, the night is far gone. The day is at hand, Paul tells us in Romans 13. So cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and in drunkenness and sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. When we're not using our time rightly, we are gratifying our own desires because we have placed ourselves above Jesus Christ and what he calls us to do. We are failing God when we do that. This life, this life we have, if you don't have Jesus Christ in it, if you're not living for Jesus Christ, this life is pointless. It's what atheists, they try to say, there is no God, there's no God. You know, the point of life is to leave a legacy behind and do things that matter. Who cares? When you die, you're gone. Nobody cares about you anymore. There's been billions of people. Somebody did the math saying that the earth is only about 8,000 years old. Just say it's that. There's only been about 40 billion people on the earth, which is a lot. There's been billions. Just a few thousand have been known and still known to this day. What good is life if there's not something more important after? And when we live for this life, instead of making good use of our time and shining a light to the world so they know who Jesus Christ is, what is the point? There is none. That's the point. There is none. That's what Proverbs, it hammers against the sluggard, the one who doesn't want to get up and go do, that wants to just lay around and be too lazy to do anything. Paul talks about it. We see it in Hebrews too. We're not supposed to just rest and be lazy. We need to get up and go and work and serve the Lord because our rest is awaiting us. You can read about it in Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. Our rest is in Jesus Christ in eternity. He is our great rest. While we're alive now, we need to be working and serving and going and doing because when we do, we are attacking the forces of evil. This whole world lies in the power of the evil one, as 1 John 5, 9 says. Paul says earlier in Ephesians 2, 2, that the prince of the power of the air is seeking to destroy all. 2 Corinthians 11, 14, Satan masquerades as an angel of light, seeking to deceive all he can. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. These few verses tell us that evil is real and present everywhere. But we don't even have to have them to see it. We just, yesterday, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, that was pure evil. Pure evil. And many other things that happened. The world is evil and only getting eviler. We need to wake up and make holy use of our time. It's God's time anyway. He has given us a brief moment of it to use. Are we going to be like the servant who hid the talent? 
in the ground because he was afraid to do anything? Or are we going to be like the other two who went and invested and brought in a game for the Lord? Which one are we going to be? Because when we do, we make we understand God's ways and will. We're made in his image. We have been given his spirit and belief. We are able to go and do. We are able to imitate God. We are able to serve and love. We are able to go out and reach people and use wisdom that has been given to us. Ephesians 1.3 tells us we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's made ours. We have it. Let's use it. That is God's will. His will is for us to live together too, in harmony, to serve each other, to not be drunk with the things of the world, but be filled with the Spirit, to give thanks always for all things, is what we're seeing in these verses that follow. To praise one another in songs and hymns, and be submitted to one another out of reverence to Christ. How often do we praise each other? How often when somebody you work with gets a promotion or benefits or something happens, how often do you go, yes, and mean it? Or do we have a tendency to go, yes, I wish that was me. We need to praise one another, build one another up. We need to seek to glorify one another for the things we have done together. As Howard Hendricks, a man who was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, once said, you need to surround yourself with people who are unimpressed by you. What that means is they won't let your big head get any bigger. But they're not going to also beat you down. They're going to praise the good things, but they're going to remind you of who you are. That's what we need to do as one another together. See, when we do this, when we're full of the Spirit and walking in wisdom, we walk in God's will and His ways. We will seek that desire He has. We will seek to take wisdom to the world. We will seek to vanquish evil the best we can. We're here to serve and love and care and have genuine joy with each other. We see it all too often, the body of Christ. This church, we're just a spot on the body. We're a local body of believers, and we have the, the small body where we can view, where we have each have a part, but the body of Christ is so much bigger than what we see right here at Western Trail County. Yeah. Tenets of faith, belief in Jesus Christ as Savior in Christ alone. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. As long as the other parts, other churches hold to that main tenet, that is what matters. They're part of the body. We're just a part. But we see so much division. So much division. Churches not wanting to work together. Not wanting to serve together to reach more people. We see churches getting jealous and trying to steal members from other churches. Instead of going and reaching the lost and getting them that way. They're trying to steal other church members. That's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to work together. Praise one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do we submit to one another? Or do we always try to be a little bit better than the next? Are we comparing ourselves? Or are we seeking to glorify Christ by elevating others? Are we doing that? Are we living for ourselves? Are we living to make something that's going to outlast us? Or are we living for us? Are we letting trials and struggles bring us down? Or are we letting them build us up? Are we letting the glory that others are having, the success that others are having, bring us up too because they're successful? Or we let that bring us down? Are we trying to live our lives vicariously through someone else? Through our children, maybe even. That's not what we need to do. We have been given a life. We are in the image of God. Let us use the wisdom and the power He has given us through the power of the Holy Spirit.
Let us do that. Let us live in submission. Let us love one another. Let us serve one another. But let us also correct one another if we have done the wrong. Just because you care and have passion for one another, you still correct them if they live in sin. You don't let them continue living in that lifestyle without telling them that is wrong. And let me show you in the Bible where it's wrong. This is not me telling you it's wrong. This is God himself telling you it's wrong. But we do it out of love and care because we are to serve and love one another. And if we have to practice any form of church discipline that we see Paul Exercise in 1 Corinthians 5 when the man who was living in that sexually immoral lifestyle and the church knew about it and they did nothing. And he said, let that man be removed. We do that with tears and a broken heart because we've had to remove someone from fellowship. We never take joy in the fall of another. Period. Even the evil people that need to fall, we still don't take joy in their death. Because if they're an unbeliever, no matter what horrendous crime they committed, Jesus Christ in Romans 5 said, has died for his enemies. When those people die outside of Christ, they go to hell and torment. We should never celebrate that. Celebrate the evil that's been stopped, but not that person who's gone to hell. We should cry over that. But celebrate the stopping of evil. It's a tough, fine, razor line to walk. But that's what we should do. Because God desires all to be saved. And he desires us to walk in wisdom. That is his will for us. That's more than a desire. This is what he has laid out to know that we need to do. And when we do this, we honor God because we're walking in his will and using his time wisely. I'll end with this. I think Freddie Fender sings well what this section is telling us in Wasted Days and Wasted Nights. He sings, Wasted Days and Wasted Nights, I have left for you behind, for you don't belong to me, your heart belongs to someone else. Why should I keep loving you when I know that you're not true? And why should I call your name when you're the blame for making me blue? See, when we hang up on the world and its ways, a way we left behind, and its heart is no longer ours, we're wasting life. It's wasted days, it's wasted night. When you're living for this world, something that we're no longer a part of. When you're a believer, you're seated in the heavenly places. Heaven, is, we're a citizen of heaven. And we're a foreigner to this land. This is no longer our land. We are aliens and exiles. We're sojourning in this land. So when we're hung up on this, it's a world that makes our heart blue. This world gives you nothing but death and heartache. Jesus Christ gives you life and joy forever. The abundant life. This world gives us nothing. So we should not long for this world. We should not tie away our lives for this world. Our life should be committed to serving the Lord in whatever form that may be. You may be a street sweeper. Sweep those streets to the glory of God. You may be a janitor. Clean them toilets to the glory of God. You may be a vet. Do all the vet work to the glory of God. You may be a theologian sitting out here and you just haven't said anything. Be a theologian to the glory of God. Your musical talents to the glory of God. Your leadership skills to the glory of God. Everything you do, do it to the glory of God. That's using your time wisely. Seek to always glorify God in everything you do. And when you do that, you've used your time wisely. When doing something, go. Is this honoring God or is this honoring me and that will help clarify a lot of things if you have to think too much on it strong possibility is more honoring to you than it is God so let us go with the passion and desire to live for Christ and use God's time wisely he's given us a brief time none of us know the day or the hour 
that he may return. None of us know the day or the hour that we may be called to him. It can happen like that. You have no clue. So let's live every moment like it's our last. Let's live every moment like the person you see in front of you is their last. I have a couple of friends that I know that have died. And I'm pretty positive they're in hell because I didn't go to them. Think about it, David. I know I'm forgiven. Maybe I could have done something. Maybe David had not have been deceived. But I didn't. Do I know for a fact they're in hell? No. I have a pretty good idea that's a strong possibility. Breaks my heart daily. I think about it when I read the great white throne judgment and revelation. It breaks my heart knowing that there's people that are going to go there because I didn't do something. Let us use our time wisely and not have that heartache in our heart because we went. As Christ, as God told Ezekiel, if you don't take this message to them, then their blood will be on your hand. But if you do take it and they reject, it's on them. Let us take the message. Even though the blood is not on our hands because we're under the blood of Christ and grace, it still hurts when it happens. Let, that not, let us not have that hurt no more. Let us use God's time wisely and go and share the message of Jesus Christ with all. Because it is eternal life or eternal torment that awaits. Christ gives everlasting life to all who believe. Every single person who believes in him, believes in him for everlasting life because he's given you forever salvation. Believe today if you have not believed. Christ died for you. He gave it all for you. And he only asks us to give a small amount. Please serve him to the glory of him, to the glory of God. That is how we have something that outlasts us that will outlast this life. That makes life worth living. Let us do that from this day forward. Use God's time wisely. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today and I thank you so much for the fact that you, you have given us this opportunity to be able to go and share this amazing message, to live a life, to bring honor and glory to you, that you have given us us, just us, humanity, this opportunity, that you have given us this, this challenge, that you have given this to us, Lord. Let no one in here waste this time. Let us use your time to, the, to reach people so people will believe upon you, Jesus, and have salvation and not suffer, but have glory awaiting them. Lord, I pray that we all will do that. I pray we will all have our hearts broken for this lost in wayward world that we will go forth and use our time wisely to leave something that will outlast us. Lord, let us go and plant that seed that will be that tree that is here for centuries after we have died. Lord, I pray that for each person in this room and I pray, Father, that we will just love you with our all. Lord, I love you. I thank you daily for Christ coming for you, Jesus, for you dying and suffering for me so I can live eternally. Thank you, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For anybody with the youth and the children, would you please hang around? I just got something I want to discuss with you.